Have you ever noticed how just the right music, your music and its vibration, seems to be in sync with your own internal vibration? Have you ever noticed how just the right words sound to your ears like poetry and combined with just the right music become an unforgettable song? And have you ever noticed how just the right song appeals to you while another you instinctively reject because it seems not to align with whatever it is that defines what you like? Yes, your music seems to have the power to move you. But what is the source of that power? Well, let's see whether we can begin to find out together. I'm going to play a series of musical clips. And all I need you to do after each one is listen carefully and become aware of one thing, whether you like it or not. And as you do so, when you hear music that aligns with you, I'd like you to think this. And when you hear music that does not align with you, I'd like you to think not this. <laughs> now, to reinforce this experience, I'd actually like you to raise your hand for your music. So you hear music that aligns with you, that you like, you raise your hand and you keep it raised until you hear music that does not align with you, that you do not like, at which point you put your hand down just as resolutely. Now, the clips are going to come in fairly quick succession, so don't overthink this. Try to be spontaneous. Are you ready? Here we go. Great, thank you for participating in that. Now, this is the point at which I let you in on the fact that that experiment had nothing at all to do with music. <laughs> that experiment was about choice. And we did it to see if we can begin to understand the paths we take to the choices we make. You see, I think we could all sense that there were differing reactions in the room to one and the same music. In fact, two people sitting close or right next to one another seemed not always able to agree on whether one and the same music was agreeable or not. Now, that would suggest to me that the music in and of itself carries no intrinsic payload that might be the foundation for a unified response. But let's not take anything for granted. Let's start with anatomy. Researchers have discovered that the shape of each human ear is quite unique. So unique, in fact, that the form of the human ear is more reliable as a source of biometric identification than the entire face, and only slightly less reliable than the iris. So from a purely physical point of view, the way that sound is bouncing off or being drawn into your ear, each of you is having a unique acoustic experience of one and the same sound. But perhaps there's also something psychological going on here. You see, at the beginning of the experiment, I said, you're not going to have very much time to reflect. 
That was deliberate. Had you had more time, your choices of this and not this might have been less spontaneous. With more time to reflect, your decisions might have been colored by such things as thoughts, feelings, and memories. These are, after all, things we know that just the right music has the power to evoke or suppress or influence in some way. So maybe it is that the music that we choose, the music that we want, we want because it serves us, because it aligns with us, allowing us to think what we want to think, feel what we want to feel, and remember what we want to remember. So for each of us, our iPod or our radio or whatever device it is that we tune into is a kind of a memory machine or perhaps even a mood machine. Now, I've been speaking a lot about alignment. And when I keep saying the word alignment, it makes me think of lines. It makes me think that there perhaps are, in some form or fashion, lines in the mind that we can use to calibrate or judge our external environment. I wonder. The idea of lines in the mind is at the core of one of my favorite yogic concepts, the concept of samskara. Samskara is a Sanskrit word and it's composed of two roots, sam and kara. Sam means joined together, and kara means action. So, joined together action. Said another way, samskaras are character dispositions. And these character dispositions are things with which we are born. They are imprinted on our subconscious and they develop in the in the course of a lifetime of experiences. Samskaras can be positive or negative, and they tend to be simple things. What we tend to think, what we tend to feel, how high or low our self-esteem tends to be, and what we tend to be sensitive to. Now, the idea of joined together action in the etymology of this word makes reference to a tendency with which I think most of us are familiar. And this is the idea that human beings, in their choices in the present moment, are influenced by the choices they have made in the past and the consequences that followed. Now, when I think of those kind of lines in the mind, choices in the past leading to choices in the present, it makes me think of evolution. It makes me think of natural selection. Because after all, nature has selected for survival those species capable of learning from experiences. And moreover, those capable of choosing whether to reenact those experiences based on the impact that they had on the members of the species. So for us human beings, our samskaras would have allowed us to uh, not replicate experiences that caused danger or death, but at the same time, repeat experiences that were positive or even pleasurable. So we have seen that there are indeed lines in the mind, but what interested the yogis was, to what extent do these lines limit us, and is it possible to change or modify them? They came to the conclusion that it is indeed possible, and they developed a catalog of uh, ways in which we can do this to help people. And I'm going to introduce you to just two. The first one is, slow down. <laughs> you see, because samskaras are part reflex with which we're born and part habit which we develop, the only way to really be aware of them in everyday life is to slow down. We can see these uh, this process of slowing down in the same way that a coach, sort of a sprinter's coach, might make a slow motion film of his trainee at the start of the race as he comes out of the blocks to allow for analysis afterwards of how the posture is and how the balance is in that process. 
And I say posture and balance because, you know, everything we do, everything we say in life is a posture. It's a pose. It's a shape. And those shapes and postures have more or less balance depending on how we execute them. The second technique is take courage. Again, because samskaras are part reflex, part habit, they kind of feel like a warm jacket in a cold room. And that jacket is made of who we think we are, where we think we're going, how we identify ourselves. And even if that jacket might be a straight jacket, it makes us feel warm. <laughs> So if we want to take a new path to a new choice and we try to take off that jacket, we need courage to put up with a little bit of disorientation and a little bit of uneasiness. So we've seen that there are lines in the mind. We've seen that we can adapt them. We've seen that we can adapt choice. But the question remains, what does choice have to do with reality in the first place? Neti Neti is another yogic concept. It's also a Sanskrit term, and it translates as not this, not this. Now, it won't surprise you to learn that this was the inspiration for the experiment we did at the beginning where you were saying this, not this. Neti Neti is a reality-defining concept, and it's based on a pretty bold statement that goes like this. The only things that are ultimately real are the things that do not change. I'll say it again. The only things that are ultimately real are the things that do not change. So in this practice, the dutiful yogi would reject as changeable and therefore unreal all manifestations of body, mind, senses, energy, intellect, arriving at uh, refined, but let's face it, also almost indescribable sense of reality. So this is a purist and perhaps extreme practice, but I have found that it does have some interesting day-to-day -day applications. I use Neti Neti to curb uncontrollable worrying. I'm a worrier. At some point in my development, perhaps in my childhood, and certainly for good reasons at the time, I developed the habit of projecting my mind into the future to try and solve every imaginable problem before it could arise. <laughs> <laughs> now, that is fine. In fact, today I like to say it allows me to do my job well, that I can do that. But when the assumptions upon which I base that projection are irrational or simply not factual, it becomes a problem. And I can hear that you all know that experience of worrying about something that you later discover isn't real. You worry, and then at some point somebody tells you the right thing, or you tell yourself the right thing, and you realize that the thing you've been worrying about is unreal. Now, try and remember the feeling of relief that you had when you realized that. And imagine what could happen if you could simply short-circuit all that worrying by applying a technique like this and saying, hang on a second, this internal climate of thoughts and feelings is changeable and therefore unreal. You see, I understand that there are circumstances about which we must think and which we must consider, maybe even worry, but even if we can't change the external circumstances, might it not be beneficial to apply this theory and feel better anyway? <laughs> Every time we say this or I like, we draw a circle within the universe of unlimited internal choices that are available to us. And we define what's in that circle as our space. When we say not this, all we are doing is defining the space outside the circle, the space that is not our space. 
Now, draw enough intersecting circles of this and I like, and you end up with a common space in the middle, which we tend to call I. It's comforting to be able to point to it and say I. It's maybe even comfortable. But to what extent does it limit us? To what extent do all these lines around I create a feedback loop of action leading to action leading to action that we can't get out of? Well, let's see what happens if we remove those circles. I don't know about you, but that I feels to me more expansive. It feels freer. That feels like an I that has choices and alternatives that were unimagined at some point. But how do we get to that I? I think we get there by questioning our reflexes and questioning our unreflected choices. Because when this becomes why this, and when not this becomes why not this, we have an opportunity to learn more about ourselves and our motivations. When we do not reject as a reflex, but ask why are we rejecting, we have the opportunity to re-evaluate the criteria upon which we make choices and also re-evaluate how relevant those criteria are to who we are today. To use a computer analogy, the question is, are we running old software? You see, for most of us, most of the time, reality is a reflex. But it doesn't have to be. Because when we question our reflexes and our unreflected choices, we lighten the lines in the mind, allowing for new alignment, for new choices, and a revisiting of reality. Thank you.